<laughs> Hi friends, it's your old pal Pop Dale here one more time to bring you another episode of our never-ending series, Christ vs. Culture. We've got hundreds of these that are in the works, and we hope that every one of them will do two things for the viewer. One, edify you and teach you something about Christian doctrine and uh, the intersection of Christian teachings and the culture. And uh, also, uh, we intend to leave it behind as a body of content for those people who are left behind after the rapture that the Holy Spirit can direct folks to. Everyone needs to keep in mind 1 John 2.15 that says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Any man that loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And what that's referring to is preferring the things of the world over the person of God, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, who am I? I'm Papa Dale. <laughs> I am a retired pastor, teacher, theologian, evangelist, chaplain, lots of things that I've done in my 50-plus uh, years of serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I'm here to serve you and to bring you this teaching. Now, it's important that, that uh, anyone who says that they're going to teach you something about the Bible, me included, that you find out something about them. The Bible says lots of false teachers are going to go out in the end times. And, and if you don't know me, if you've never looked at my video uh, about my history and so forth, or listen to very many of my teachings, you don't know whether I'm a false teacher or not. And so check me out. Um, the video I'm referring to is uh, uh, Papa Dale intro video number zero. It's on any of my Bible-related uh, playlists on my channel. And so check me out and uh, mostly check what I say out against the Bible. And uh, I certainly do uh, try as hard as I can, as sensitive as I can be to the Holy Spirit, to present to you clear, true Bible teaching. But check me out. That's your responsibility. So uh, that's who I am. And I don't have uh, anything more that I can do about that or say about that. So this video is titled... It's the Christ and Culture series, and it's titled, Rome is Babylon. <laughs> How can that be? Rome, Babylon's in Persia, Rome's in Italy. Well, spiritually, Rome is Babylon. So off we go now. All of the pagan practices and celebrations of ancient Babylon survive today. They came from the first and the most evil first world dictator, Nimrod. Babylon was his city and was punished by Yahweh for disobedience, by, by Yahweh confounding their language, destroying their tower, and scattering the people across the earth. This was a long, 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 long time ago. You know, it's... It's like a couple thousand years between now, going backward in time, to Rome. More than 2,000 years to when Rome was first founded. And from the time of Rome, going back into history to Babylon, was another couple thousand years. I mean, it was a great distance in time between Rome and Babylon. doesn't seem like that to us because all of it is such ancient history. But the spirit that motivated uh, the um, people of Babylon, the leaders of Babylon, Nimrod in particular, to rebel against God, that evil spirit still exists today and transferred to other cities as we're going to get to here in just a second. The religious system and the celebrations of Babylon moved first to Pergamos in Asia Minor, and they set up their pagan worship there, and then later to Rome. And then later yet, in the 4th century, after Satan discovered that he couldn't kill off 
Christianity by persecution. It only made Christianity stronger. Uh, Satan motivated the political leaders of Rome to declare it, Rome, to be first acceptable, then mandatory, and then conflated and commingled the teachings of Rome, the teachings of Christianity, with polytheistic paganism. And so what you have in the Roman church today and the Roman religion today is not pure Christianity. It's Christianity commingled with polytheistic paganism. Now that hybrid of Christianity and paganism metastasized within the institutional church of Rome. It became that institution which had dozens of leaders, popes, cardinals, bishops, priests, who had multiple wives, multiple concubines, and, forced, and focused on twisting church and politics into a collecting political economic power by murder, theft, and manipulation. See, human, fallen human nature, as assisted by and motivated by the evil that opposes God that's in the world, always, always, always tries to pollute and pervert and redirect anything that is pro-God, solidly Christian, into a direction that will take it into the most gross uh, of evils. And that's what happened with the Roman church. The church also persecuted and murdered more to true Christians than all other organizations in history. Isn't that amazing? The vast majority of Christian persecutions and murders and martyrdom came either at the hands of Rome itself or with the acquiescence of the, the leadership of the church at Rome. This hybrid was passed down month by month, year by year, generation by generation, to become the Roman Catholic Church of today. Pedophilia Central. Many false doctrines perpetuated. Pagan days of celebration and doctrine were passed on and moved easily into the church. Roman Christianity tried to stamp out all other churches, all other centers of belief in Christ, by claiming only they had the approval of Jesus to represent him. They falsely claimed Peter was the first pope, and they held a person's salvation hostage to that person's allegiance to their club by threat of eternal hell. They denied personal access to the Holy Scripture and made everyone dependent on their interpretation and doctrine and teaching. They forced nations into wars, and then they collected the booty. Things were forced to change by the Reformation and the spread of personal Bible reading. But the basic doctrines of the Roman Church are unchanged. Now here are my top ten Roman Catholic errors. One, church tradition is more important than scripture. Two, salvation is by grace plus your works. Three, salvific grace can be dispensed by the church organization. Four, Mary is a co-deity as the mother, quote they call her, the mother of God. Five, the bread you know, in the Eucharist, in communion, the bread becomes, becomes, actually becomes, magically becomes, miraculously becomes the body of Christ. Six, the Roman church replaces Israel. Seven, the rule of the Roman church is the millennium. Eight, 
purgatory and penance to escape it. The whole idea of purgatory and penance. After you die, you go to a place of torment so that any remaining sins can be burned out of you. And, but you can, you can offer penance, offer money, offer performance of good works to alleviate this persecution in purgatory. There's nothing you can do to avoid it, but you can shorten it by giving money to the church or by doing good works. Number nine, confessing sins to a priest. Number ten, papal infallibility. Whatever the Pope says goes. Disregard the idea that he's got a fallen human nature too. Well, with all of that going on, <laughs> man, can Roman Catholics even be saved? Yes, they can. So can Baptists and Anglicans and Methodists and Presbyterians and all the other church club members who have uh, a basic salvific doctrine, soteriology, theologians call it, but it's a basic salvific teaching that, uh, when applied to you, um, makes you to be a born-again, born-of-the-spirit Christian. But no doctrine from any of these institutional organizations is pure and perfect. The gospel that saves, the only gospel that saves, is clear and articulated in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5. Pay attention. Quote, Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, says, quote, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which, this gospel, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preach to you, unless you've believed in vain. Now, if your belief was just a surface belief, you didn't really commit to it, you didn't really believe it deeply in your heart, then it was a vain belief. But if you keep these things in memory, deeply and deeply commit to them, then you're saved. Paul continues, For I delivered, un delivered unto you, first of all, that which I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He died in our place. We were, we were supposed to die for our own sins. Christ stepped in and said, I'll do it for you. So, first, according to the scriptures, Christ died for our sins. Then he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. What's important about that? He was physically buried. His body was buried. He was a real human being that was buried. Why three days? Because, according to Jewish tradition, a person wasn't really considered dead, not dead dead, until they'd been buried for three days. And so, Jesus conformed to that tradition. And then he rose again on the third day. What does that mean? He rose again bodily, physically. His actual physical body reanimated, came back to life, was filled again with his own spirit, and rose to normal human existence. Again, actually not quite the same existence as before, because the existence uh, after resurrection uh, had, had uh, uh, some differences in them. Uh, for one example is, um, when he was talking to the disciples later on, he said, come check me out, feel my hands, feel my feet, see that it's really me, my body, uh, and I'm not a spirit uh, because a, a body of flesh uh, is real and physical and a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones like you see that I have. 
He didn't say anything about blood. Why not? Because his, he gave his blood as a sacrifice for sin. Why do you do that? Because according to Genesis, or, or according to Exodus rather, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Actually, I think it's Leviticus that I'm talking about. But the life of the flesh is in the blood. And so he gave his blood, he gave his life, for you and for me, that that our sins could be forgiven. And then when he rose again, the evidence that he did rise again physically and bodily is that he was seen by Peter, by Cephas, and then of the twelve. And so seen he was seen multiple, multiple times. He was seen by by several women at the tomb right after he was resurrected. He was seen by, by uh, uh, the twelve minus uh, minus Judas and minus uh, Thomas. So seen by the ten in the upper room uh, later on that day. Uh, about a week later, he was seen by all all twelve of the apostles, uh, and uh, he was seen by uh, disciples on the road to Emmaus, where he spoke to them about. Uh, why the Messiah, he himself, had to suffer and die. Then he was seen by 500 people all at the same time. Uh, we think that that happened on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And, and we think that, that he preached to those people like he did uh, before the 5,000 earlier in his ministry and before the 4,000. Uh, but he was seen according to uh, this scripture, a little further on, verse 6 or 7, he was seen by more than 500 people. All at once. All at once. So, Paul goes on to say, if you continue to sincerely believe that, which church you attend doesn't affect your salvation. Now, many pastors, many churches will try to wear down your belief in the gospel by trying to superimpose their interpretations over and above what I've just read to you, that Paul said. They'll say, oh, well, you've got to believe all of that, but you've also got to be a member of the church. And then they'll twist scripture to try to, to demonstrate that that's what scripture is saying, but it's not. Or they'll say, well, you've got to tithe. Because greedy people want to have lots of money uh, given to the church. And you, know, you don't need to do any of that. You just need to believe. Or some, some will say, oh, it, it all depends on uh, dressing in a very humble and modest way. And some churches will say, oh, you got to be baptized by our leadership into our church. None of that pertains to salvation. Paul didn't say anything about any of that stuff in terms of it being salvific. What is salvific is that you believe that the Lord Jesus Christ, the, exclusively him, Lord, uh, the divine Son of God, Jesus, the human man who was born of the Virgin, Christ anointed for the purpose of saving you from your sins, the Lord Jesus Christ lived, was crucified, was buried, and on the third day rose again from the dead and was seen. That is the gospel. Anything else is a side issue. That is salvific. Anything else is extra and doesn't affect your salvation. Okay? Am I clear? Uh, are we straight? <laughs> Many will try to get you to rely on your behavior plus grace to be saved. Don't listen to them. Many of them are well-intentioned. Many of them are well-meaning. But they themselves are mixed up. Scripture says, quote, For by grace... Are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves? 
It is the gift of God, and not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, if salvation came because you believed in, on the Lord Jesus Christ, but also because you worshipped on the correct day, a lot of them will say you got to worship on Saturday. And so because you came to church and worshipped on the correct day, that adds something to your salvation. No, it doesn't. The scripture just said it. It's by, it's by grace are you saved through faith. Not grace plus what day you worship on. Not grace plus what uh, amount of money that you give to the church. Not grace plus what church you were baptized in. None of those things matter. I know, I'm hammering this point, aren't I? Hammer, 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 hammer. <laughs> okay, I'll drop it for now. But remember, it's by grace. The gra Whose grace? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That you are saved through faith, through, through a continued believing all the way to death. And it's not of yourselves by any good works that you can do. It's just simply by faith. Well, how do works fit in? Well, I'm sure that we'll talk more about that later on. But, but the real nutshell is works simply manifest the fact that you have been saved. If you've been saved, then you'll do good works in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's not the works that save you. It's his grace through faith that saves you. And then you're so happy about that. You're so thankful about that. Then you go on and, and do some good works, which includes telling other people about the grace of Jesus Christ and how they can be saved and so forth. So that's it for now. Those are my last thoughts on this topic, uh, which is Rome is Babylon. And so don't believe Rome, don't believe Babylon. <laughs> believe the Bible. Believe the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe the Holy Spirit. If you have comments, questions, or prayer requests, you can leave them down below on this very channel. Uh, there's also a link to my Facebook page. You can leave them there. And there's also a link to the lesson notes if you want to review those. Uh, I never know what the next video is going to be about. It's always something good. The Holy Spirit always leads us into something good. But for now, this is your old pal Papa Dale signing off and saying, I'm going to be praying for you, that you will be well and that you will be blessed. <laughs>